Hello everyone, this is Babak Naini. I'm working in Biojo Climate Modeling Lab in the University of Helsinki. As part of ENM 2020, I'm going to talk about SDM, that is an R package for species distribution modeling. This package was published as a software note in the Journal of Ecography by me and Miguel Araujo as a cover paper. Uh, I'm still working actively to develop the package and including new functionalities. Um, so I will talk about the details in the next slides. In general, you know that the procedure of uh, developing a species distribution model starts with data. We would have a species observation and also environmental variables. And then we explore a statistical relationship between uh, the response variable and the predictor variables to come up with a model, a predictive model. We then use this model to generate the probability of occurrence. It predicts these values in a space or time. In this box, actually, we would have different approaches to explore this statistical relationship. Um, so all of these techniques based on regression methods or machine learning approaches uh, have the same aim, that is exploring the relationship between the response variable and predictor variables, but each technique uses uh, a different approach or different way to, to do the job. Um, so uh, in data, we would have different uh, resources for both uh, species for uh, data and environmental data. Um, that are available, for example, in GBIF data portal uh, in the form of presence only or presence absence. We may have access to data in the form of abundance or even species traits. For environmental data also, there are many resources recently uh, became available. For example, um, uh, the climatic data or land cover data Remote sensing technology actually played a significant role uh, to provide uh, products at different scales. Uh, we have new technologies like drone, environmental sensors, or crowdsourcing approaches that uh, provide uh, data for us that uh, they are growing every, every day. Uh, that is why we hear the term of big data. Handling such big data requires uh, solution, uh, computational solution or a storage solution. Uh, so for example, using high performance computing, we can boost the performance of handling such data and we would be able to manage them. We also have a different modeling technique, a modeling algorithm that works based on different approaches, as, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, they resulted in different algorithms that uh, are growing every year. Uh, we also require some uh, data analysis method, for example, for model evaluation or interpretation of the models or visualization. All of these uh, components in the procedure of species distribution modeling actually uh, uses uh, different tools and uh, such tools are available uh, for example through some standalone uh, software like open modeler or maxent or garp uh, or r also provides a lot of packages to for handling for example spatial data there are many packages available or for uh, either of those uh, modeling algorithms that uh, was mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so all of these tools uh, are available, but they are scattered. On the other hand, uh, species distribution modeling is a workflow. A workflow starts with data and then uh, the data will be used to develop the model, to fit the model, the model then will be used to predict uh, 
the distribution and the results are interpreted. All of these uh, major component actually uses different tools and methods. Uh, there are some packages, for example, developed in R that uh, provides functionality for uh, part of this workflow. These different tools are not following the same standards and uh, uh, to handle this workflow more efficiently, we need a kind of integration of the methods into a kind of unified, unified framework. We have, for example, Biomoto as one of the first packages that try to integrate these tools together and enable a user to uh, run the whole workflow for uh, species. <clears throat> and there are uh, new newer packages also developed in recent years. STM also is such a platform that has the same dream and it works with the other packages. For example, USTM is another package that I developed and uh, can be used with STM together. Uh, in the next slides, I'm going to discuss the key capabilities of STM and some unique features that are provided by STM. First of all, STM is an integrated R platform and is, can be considered as a comprehensive modeling and simulation framework support different modeling approaches and also offers different tasks that is used for pre-processing, processing and post-processing uh, within the species distribution modeling workflow. Uh, one of the uh, important capability of STM is, uh, is the uh, extensibility of the package. It means that it can be extended by users. I will discuss the details later. It also supports reproducibility. It is an object-oriented platform. I'm not going to discuss the details about object-oriented, but I can summarize that each um, uh, all the data methods and each part of each component in the package are designed as a a, spe a special class. For example, we have a species data class that has different parts uh, that contains all the details about the species. And this, this class may be linked to other classes. For example, this, this class actually keep metadata for species and so on. We have the same for uh, methods. It is also extensible. STM actually uh, get benefits from some container class that keeps, for example, different methods inside this container. But uh, the advantage is that new methods can be easily added, not only by developers, but also by users. The current version of the package supports 19, 19 machine learning approaches but the new approach can be added by users. It also supports ensemble forecasting. Uh, adding a new method is very simple. There are some templates uh, that uh, is used to define the existing method. For example, this list is the definition for the method of GLM and is available as part of the package. And we have, they have a function in the package that is called add. So a user may, for example, add a new method or wants to customize this method uh, and name it, for example, GLM2. Uh, so by preparing this list, uh, uh, it is possible to add the new method uh, to the package. It may seem scary, but it's not. Here, for example, we simply specify the names of the method, the package that it depends on, and also the type of the data that can be supported by this, uh, this uh, method, presence, absence, presence, background, abundance, or nominal data. Um, 
we can specify the fitting parameters fitting setting and the function that is used it can be like a, a character that refers to the function that is available uh, in in already installed as a package or as available in R but it can also be a new function that is developed by a user uh, there are some setting rules that can be specified uh, that uh, it can be uh, changed or uh, it, it means that uh, we can specify some rules that given the uh, given the condition of data we may change them we have also a possibility to specify how the parameters can be tuned we have the same settings for predict function and also we have some optional uh, parts for metadata that who developed this object what is the source the email and all the information about citation and so on Another key feature of the package is that it is extremely easy to use. First of all, it can handle different data types, uh, like a spatial data, um, or if it's in a form of data frame, both can be handled. It can handle common issues in the data. If you have missing data or duplication, they are automatically detected and fixed. Uh, I try to make it as flexible as possible. It is less sensitive to small mistakes. If you have some typos in some arguments, uh, usually they are handled. Uh, the functions are s smart enough to understand what you mean. And it is followed by a graphical user interface that is powered by Shiny. So we have some interface to interactively explore the results and uh, work with different parts of the package it uses high performance computing to handle big data or when you have like uh, uh, multiple species or your your you have different replications to run so uh, it can use the power of your hardware to boost the performance and it doesn't only support presence absence but also abundance data as a dream we uh, would like to couple it with mechanistic model in future versions as well so as i mentioned it is a workflow it starts with different form of data a tabular form or a spatial form when it gets into the workflow we have uh, some pre-processing a step to prepare the data object uh, a user can specify some settings for developing the model and then the processing is done the model object is created and then there are some functions for post-processing or predicting or evaluating of the models so this workflow as i mentioned before can be divided into these sections data model prediction interpretation if we want to just summarize it easily um, as a at a glance uh, the key functions in the stm package the most important function is stm data that is used to prepare the data so you would have uh, different forms of data like you can have either data frame that you have everything predictor and species data together into a data frame or you may have them as a spatial data like a point data for species uh, or raster variables for predictors and then this goes into another function that is called SDM to fit the model you can use different algorithms here at the same time or multiple species at the same time and then it goes into the predict function the predict or the ensemble ensemble actually uh, combines the prediction of different algorithms and different replications together to come up with a single output so predict generates for example if the 
data is a spatial it generates a spatial layers for each model and each replication here i just put the result for two models glm and boosted regression tree but uh, if you use ensemble they are combined into a uh, final uh, probability of occurrence in this case there are um, other outputs for example um, so we can have the distribution of uh, habitat suitability uh, over geographical space or in environmental space here we have like two dimensional niche here and we can see the distribution of the suitability versus unsuitable area we have other uh, graphs like uh, rock curve, AUC values, density plots, uh, the discrimination capacity, response curve, uh, variable importance and so on. So it's like a quick overview of uh, some functionalities in the package. Um, I, here I simulate uh, the key steps to, to be able to discuss uh, some unique features of the functions the key functions but uh, we will have a live demonstration for a real project as well uh, first of all to install the package you can simply use the install.packages and put the name of the package there so it's available on CRAN but the developer version of the package is also available on GitHub usually we have a, a newer version here um, and so if you really want to have the latest version probably you can try this one uh, when you install the package you simply load the package and then there is for the first time only for the first time you you're going to use install all install all just install the other required packages because it supports like 19 algorithms and we have a lot of other packages that are required by those algorithms so they first need to be installed by using this install all they are all installed automatically then the first key function is stm data stm data has different arg arguments formula train test predictors background this one is coordinate reference system so some of them are optional uh, so training data actually is uh, clear it can be as a species point data as a spatial point data frame or it can be a data frame that contains all the, the species and predictor variables uh, this test data actually uh, would be independent test data because it is common that we sometimes need to partition the data divided into training and test data you don't need to do that yourself and put it here if you have if you want to just uh, subsample your data and use part of that as a test data you don't need to do it separately and put it here it only requires a data when you have some independent test. otherwise you just ignore it uh, if you don't have a data frame containing all the variables all the predictors and response variable there but if you have for example a point data you may require also predictor variables that are in the form of raster data sets if that is the case you're going to just introduce those rasters here in the predictors variable but as i said it's optional it only you only need to define the raster predictors when you don't have such data in the train in, in this part. If your data is uh, presence absence, you're fine, or it's abundance, you're fine. Otherwise, if it's presence only, you're gonna just specify the setting for background data or pseudo absence. Um, pseudo absence or background data can be uh, defined here, the setting, the setting for generating background data can be defined here for example here i just simply say use a random distribution over geographical space and then generate thousand records so uh, here you just specify a list alternatively 
you can specify you can introduce the background record if you have the background record separately or you generate it using for example a new approach that you know uh, you may generate it as a data frame so your background data frame needs to have all the predictor variables as well as the coordinates column in and then you can uh, put the data frame here in BG. Um, we also have here formula that I didn't I, I didn't talk about. The formula is very important here because it provides a lot of flexibility to to you know handle the data and specify uh, different components of data. For example, you can simply as a common way of specifying data. You can specify a specific formula you can specify it like this in the left hand side you have the name of a species that is a column for example your data frame or a special a spatial points data frame and in the right hand side you you're going to specify the name of the predictor variables it's it has been used in many other tools as well um, if you leave empty the left hand side uh, I mean, if you don't specify the name of the species data, um, uh, the the function is gonna try to find it uh, automatically to detect that data, and it looks for the data that is uh, in a binomial form. So, if you have a column that has a presence and absence or one zero, they are gonna be detected as a species if you don't specify the name. Um, if you specify dot here, it means that all the rest of variables are considered as predictor. Uh, of course, you can put dot here and leave this one. So it, it detects the species columns and then consider the rest as the predictors. If in the left hand side, you may, you may have, for example, several species, multiple species, that is specify SP1, SP2, SP3. So you can specify the names here. If you don't specify, they are detected automatically. So it means that you can have both um, single species and multiple species handled here in this function. Um, um there are some other functions working the formula here we have f f uh, or factor is um, is used when you you have some categorical data or factor type data um, if your data set in your data set they are specified as a factor and if you don't specify it here, it will be detected automatically. But you can always be sure that if this, the definition is wrong or some problematic issue is with your data, you can define that this variable is a factor or is a categorical variable. So you can specify it here. And then we have another one that is chords uh, or coordinates. Uh, so if you have columns that specify coordinates, uh, geographical coordinates, for example, you're gonna specify the name of columns like this. So this way you specify which data in which uh, columns in your data frame or which data are should be considered as coordinate data. This function also handles time. If you have like uh, the date for events, the records, uh, you're gonna just specify. So temporal data also is handled here. We have all more other functions that don't go to the details. For example, we have group. If your records should be grouped by, you know, you, you're gonna just group them based on, you know, something in environment like ge geological feature or whatever you're gonna just uh, specify the grouping factors here as well uh, and, and many more but when you uh, specify when you use this stm data you're gonna just generate an object that is called stm data so this is an example here we have spg that is a spatial point state of frame the name of a species is simply a species 
So we have specified the name of a species and the rest is considered as a predictor. The predictors are a raster uh, are uh, within a raster object called uh, preds and we specify the setting for uh, back generating background or pseudo absence. When you run this one, you get an object that we named it D. When you execute D, you're going to just get a summary report. So here it is uh, mentioning that we have only one species. The name of a species is a species. It can be any name, of course. Uh, we have uh, eight predictors. Um, the form of data is presence background. It, it is automatically detected. It can be presence background, presence only, presence absence, or abundance, or multinomial. Uh, whether we have uh, independent test data, we had another argument test. But since we don't have, it is false. The total number of records are specified here. And the object has a coordinate information. So that is a summary report and summarize the details uh, that is available within the D object. In the second step, when we generate the STM data object, we're going to use the STM function. In the STM function, we again have a formula. Here we can specify um, the name of a species, the name of predictors, or different feature forms if you want, and then introduce data. And in the third argument, we can specify the name of different modeling algorithm. Uh, it can be only one or all the 19 available algorithm so here in this case we specify four algorithms here and then we have some other arguments that uh, that uh, can specify the partitioning procedure uh, for example the method that generates different replications here is subsampling 30% uh, of the data should be used for this subsampling procedure and the whole procedure should be repeated five times that is the meaning of this tree argument for the replication we have currently three methods subsampling bootstrapping cross validation so you can specify here either sub or boot or cv uh, it can be abbreviation or the full name doesn't matter uh, but at the same time, you you may use uh, three of them or two of them together. So you're going to specify a vector, and inside the vector, you're going to specify, for example, both sub and CV. If you specify cross validation or CV, you're going to just add another argument that is CV.false. That is the number of uh, false in cross validation. For example, the default, I think, is. Uh, four or five that means four folds cross validation for example when you fit the model you and when you execute this m for example you're gonna just get a summary report this one doesn't belong to this this of this function because here i was a specific i specify only two methods glm and brt so here you're gonna just see the number of species, the number of modeling methods selected, in that case GLM and BRT. You see how many of replications are successfully finished for each technique, you see. And then a summary report for the performance. Uh, here in this summary report we have uh, four statistic, but in fact this function uh, uses I think uh, 12, uh, 10 or 12 um, different metrics to measure the accuracy of the method. So it uh, it shows the uh, mean value of AUC over different replications. If you had for example five replications it's gonna be the mean value of AUC but for each 
a single model you can get the uh, report separately as well and the third step is the predict function so in the predict function you specify the model object the output of the stm package then you specify the predictors um, over which you're gonna just uh, generate the probability of occurrence and then since this predictor is a raster object you're gonna specify the name of uh, the raster object the output raster object if this is a data frame you can specify a csv file so um, you have some other arguments as well for example another argument is mean mean equal true returns a mean prediction for different replications of each modeling algorithm for example if you use subsampling with five replications for each technique this way is going to generate five predictions for glm for example five predictions for boosted regression tree but if you put mean equal to you're gonna just have one output for glm and one output for brt that is the average over those five replications um, we have another function that is ensemble functions it's the same uh, so for it starts with the model object in the second one if you put the output of the predict function it they will be used to just generate the ensemble but if you specify the predictors the function first generate the predictor uh, the the prediction output and then combines them into an ensemble output so you have um, the model object the predictors and you you can have also a file name here if uh, if you want to save it as a file name physically and then this one is also important the setting uh, there are different methods available uh, in how to combine different uh, different outputs uh, like weighted averaging on weighted averaging uh, PA would be just uh, averaging or presence absence uh, it's you can use uh, for example uncertainty or entropy that generates a kind of uh, inconsistency between different models uh, there are many other methods are available so you can just uh, check the help of the function and the details are there uh, when you use, for example, weighted averaging, you're going to just use the performance metric as a weighting factor. Uh, TSS here is used, TSS metric, but it can be AUC or other metrics that are available in the uh, package. Uh, when you use a threshold dependent metric like TSS, you're going to just specify which optimization uh, threshold criterion is used here the default is two that refers to the threshold that maximizes tss uh, the details is available in the help page um, we have a website i have a website where i put the, a quick tutorial for how to use the package so you can just check the website to see the details of an example and the functionalities. Uh, there is another website. It, it is also my website. I put some, some information there. Uh, for example, this, this uh, positional uncertainty is uh, the uh, the result, the summary of the uh, a work that I published uh, in Journal of Biogeography and another one in Journal of Echography that uh, describes some uh, functionalities to deal with positional uncertainty. It's it's uh, not very it's it's very easy to follow. I recommend if you, if the positional uncertainty in your data is a concern, I recommend to check this one and these two paper. 
in, in a summary, I put the functionality there in the USDM package. And the idea here is to check the autocorrelation or local uh, autocorrelation in your spatial data to understand whether the positional uncertainty is a concern or not. The details are there. I recommend you to join our SDM group. It is a Google group. Um, um, so many people who are the users of the SDM package are there. And you have any question, uh, it is likely that it will be answered by me or by the other members. Uh, you can be in touch uh, through Twitter or you can check my GitHub account as well, where I, where uh, actually this this is the host of the STM and all my other R packages. Um, for the rest of the uh, this video, I'm going to um, have a live demonstration for a real example uh, to model the distribution of this species, uh, cheetah. You, you can see the scientific name here. So we are going to measure the impact of climate change on the potential distribution of cheetah. Uh, to do that, we are going to use a world clean data, bioclean data for the current time and the future time, and also download the records from GBIF. Uh, I will check the multicollinearity in the data and then uh, develop the models and generate the prediction or projection for the current time and future time they are they will be compared to uh, characterize the changes or the shifts in the range of the species that's it uh, i will be with you in a second thank you very much hello everyone i'm back uh, now we start the live demo i already started the script and I assume that you already installed the STM package, also set your working directory. Um, and then as, a, as, as for the beginning, you just load the required packages. Here I put the, I load the STM, as well as some other libraries like Dismo, Deploy, R, TidyR, and MapView. If you don't have uh, uh, these packages, either of these packages, please install them first. The name of the species is here. I'm going to use the GB function in the Dismo package. We have another library uh, for downloading GBIF data that is called RGBIF. It's more advanced, but uh, here uh, we can use this one as well. It's simple and easy to use and it works. So for uh, the GB function, we need to put the name of genus as the first argument and the name of a species as the second argument. Uh, there is another argument that is called download. If you turn it to false, you're going to just check whether there is any records available. So now we have like almost 6,000 records available in GBIF. And uh, I turn this download to true and put it into the SP object. If you check the help page of the GB function, uh, there are other arguments. Uh, for example, geo equal true, just only download uh, the, those records that have geographical information. It is by default true, so it's okay. If you turn SP, SP to true, you're gonna get a spatial point data frame, but here I'm going to have it uh, as a data frame, as a simple data frame. Uh, so let's download it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> it will be resulted as a data frame, but I'm going to check the class and also the dimension of the object. Okay. Uh, so we know that it's a data frame. If we check the dimension, we have uh, 5,914 records. 
and 170 columns, uh, 170 variables. In RStudio, uh, you can simply put the name of the data frame here and put a dollar sign, and then you're gonna just uh, uh, see a list of all the columns, all the variables available here. Uh, that specifies, for example, the name of a species uh, and uh, basis of records and many other uh, many other definitions that we may not require them here uh, what we require here the most important are the uh, coordinate data that is longitude and latitude uh, for example the basis of records the basis of record to specify the source of observation here if i put into the table it, it says uh, which type of uh, which base of records we have uh, like nine observation from fossil fuels fossil uh, specimen uh, we have um, human observation uh, many of them are uh, read, read by machine so they they may be subjected to kind of uncertainty uh, so here in this case i'm not going to uh, uh, think deeply on which which part should be excluded or not uh, i'm sure you had some lectures about data cleaning but uh, but uh, for all practice uh, this this uh, these records are too much so we are going to filter part of that one that's why we we can just keep uh, those that are based on human observation based on observation and are also reserved a specimen. Uh, to, do, to do that, uh, we are going to uh, simply use a, a filter function, for example, in deploy our package. In the filter function, you can have like filter SP, the name, and then specify uh the the selection criteria the filter criteria uh that is the basis of record the column uh should be in i mean the values in this column should be either of the items that i specify here like human observation so either of these if if the value if is either of these three uh, values uh, the records are kept uh, instead of uh, putting using this filter function here uh, it is common that we keep out the first argument like sp here and use a pipe operation so this pipe operation actually put here the, i mean that the item that you put here in as a first argument within the function that you put after the pipe this way actually you can pipe different functions together there is no difference in the performance but uh, it is more readable so you can uh, use something like this for example sp goes into filter another and the result with another pipe goes to another function and so on so I'm going to write the results uh, here uh, and if I check the number of row of SP you see that uh, we lost uh, uh, more than 4000 records here okay the next step is uh, to only keep the coordinate columns because we don't need the other columns here I just uh, use uh, a new name SVG to to select the columns of longitude and latitude within the object. Uh, you can see here if if, if I put SP dollar sign and uh, you see we have a longitude column and latitude column. Uh, so if that is the case, then you're going to just uh, specify the name of the coordinate columns here. Uh, and if I run this one and check the head of SPG, you see it's only a data frame with two columns. I'm going to add another column. 
like it can be a species and all can be assigned to one because it's like a presence only data and all the values are one but we're, we're gonna need a column for the species data so to do that I can simply use a uh, spg dollar sign and put the name like a species all equal to one something like this can be used here so if I check this one you see longitude latitude and species are the columns that uh, we used uh, for uh, continuing with this exercise so it's a species data that we downloaded uh, the next step actually i'm going to uh, to to convert this SPG to a spatial point data frame. Currently the class of SPG is a data frame, but if I use the coordinates column and put SPG here and then specify the name of the coordinate columns, Uh, so this way you can uh, you can convert the uh, data to a spatial point data frame but uh, you see I got the error because of uh, missing values in uh, in uh, the records uh, so some of the records uh, have an A in either longitude or latitude uh, you can simply use uh, a function called drop underline an A in the tidr package that is one way to do that a simple way is uh, to, to remove those uh, missing information or an A values so if I use this one and run again the number of row in SPG you see I uh, I lost 500 more records so now I can run this one and if I check the class of the new SPG it's a spatial point state of frame it's a spatial object uh, the next step I'm going to download the bioclean data from the world clean uh, I know that you can go uh, directly to the worldclean.org website that download, to download the latest version currently the version 2.1 is available but there is a function in the raster package called uh, uh, get data that is a useful function to download the bioclean data it's uh, still not uh, the word the latest version is uh, 1.4 but uh, for the purpose of our exercises it would it, it would be okay the 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 variables are available at different resolution you're gonna see the details here in the help page of the function uh, but uh, we are going to uh, specify bioclean variable from the world clean source and the coarsest resolution uh, here in this exercise to make everything quick so i'm going to just simply copy this one and paste here and put the name here uh, sorry i had the typos so it downloads the data if I check the object it is a raster stack object with 19 variables from uh, the name is bio 1 bio 2 until bio 19 I can check the names to make sure that everything is in order so you see we had the 19 bio clean variable and if I use the plot function for example to plot the first layer within the bio object I'm gonna get the global distribution of temperature the global map of temperature 
so that is the data I can also add the downloaded species data that is a species on top of that if I just simply run this one you see that uh, the distributions are here and we have some records that are probably all players here uh, usually if you have knowledge about the species it's always good to clean your data for example for this special species uh, i know that the distribution should be here and not here so th these records might be uh, incorrect that's why i'm going to just a subset of to just consider a subset of data here and uh, also uh, fit my model based on the data that are cropped over this this uh, area to do that i'm going to just uh, simply specify a rectangle by using the draw extend function in the raster package so i put it in e here the function is draw extend and if i run it i'm gonna just specify the uh, upper left and do the lower right of the extent here uh, so then I can use this extent to crop both the species data and environmental variable so let's uh, crop SPG uh, using the crop function the crop uh, in the first argument I'm going to put the name of the object the special object in this case SVG and then I'm going to put the extent here that we just created and if I run this one and again run points SVG this time I'm gonna change the color to red to make sure they are not mixed with the previous one so you see only these points within the rectangles are selected and they are excluded um, I can do the same for bio I can make it bio C for example the name of the object uh, so so it can be the same function crop put the name of raster object here and then the rectangle the extent here and if i run this one and plot bio c you're gonna just the first layer You see that we subset the raster variables as well so this is a raster brick object with 19 variables so far we downloaded the species data and bioclimatic variable now i'm going to start the workflow for developing a species distribution model to do that, first, uh, when, when especially you use such uh, bioclimatic variable or climatic variables, uh, it is likely that your variables are uh, subjected to multicollinearity issue. And multicollinearity is the case when you have a strongly co correlated variables among the predictors. Uh, there are different approaches to, uh, to check the, the issue and fix the issue. For example, you can use a, a pairwise correlation or another approach is variance inflation factor. Uh, there are um, there are uh, hybrid approaches like uh, using both correlation and uh, VIF that uh, I implemented actually in the USDM package. So if you use the USDM package. There are two functions called VIF step or VIF core that can be used for this purpose. VIF step actually checks variance inflation factor and as a rule of thumb if it is 
uh, greater than uh, than uh, 10 then it is a sign of multicollinearity so this a stepwise procedure it, it uses a stepwise procedure and then ch checks the VIF uh, finds the one that is greater than the threshold that by default it's 10 you can change it of course and then if it's greater than the threshold it removes the one with the highest VIF and then repeat the procedure until you get all the variables with the VIF less than the threshold the VIF core function actually first checks the correlation coefficient pairwise correlation and then uh, if it's greater than threshold for example 0 0.7 or 0 0.9 the default is 0 0.9 uh, so among the pair that has the highest correlation and is greater than the threshold it should decide which one should be excluded and it excludes the one with the higher VIF so it's like combining both correlation and VIF and it repeats the, the procedure again until you get uh, with a list of variables that are less than the threshold uh, as the input of the VIF step, you can uh, specify the mm, raster object like here BIOC. Uh, if you simply want to check the VIF of the current number of variable variables, you can use it uh, like VIF function. It just generate the VIF values for different variables uh, and. Uh, but uh, you can also introduce the, a data frame as the input. Uh, we are going actually probably for SDMs it's better because we have a species record and we can extract the values over those records as a data frame or matrix and then put into the function. So uh, let's uh, use the extract function from the raster package to extract uh, to extract a species data from the raster variable so we have a species point here and then the raster value the raster object here so it extracts the raster values over these points these locations and we can put it in x here the extracted values if I check the head of this matrix, you can see that for each variable, for all the 19 bioclean variables, we extracted the values from the rasters at each. So each row corresponds to each point. And we have like here, we just only the first six rows in the matrix. So if I put this E x here and assign v i'm going to use vif step uh, let's uh, you can use either of them if i run this one and then check the object here it says 11 variables from 19 input 19 by clean variables have the collinearity problem so it says which variables have the problem should be excluded <clears throat> and which variables should be kept so now it says bio 2 bio 3 bio 8 and it reports the vif here and it's just a report that which variables based on collinearity should be remained in the object if you are okay with this one you're going to just use the exclude function to physically exclude the, the variables from your raster object that is uh, by C and let's make it uh, like uh, um, yeah by C again I can so if I run this by C I only kept eight variables based on the collinearity now i'm going to use the functionality in the sdm package uh, we already loaded but let's just put it here to be sure that everything is all right as i mentioned in my presentation the first 
function that we are going to use is stm data in the stm data we're going to specify a formula that specifies the species and the predictor variables left hand side right hand side uh, the name of a species is a species I just if you remember I add a new column and just simply name the species and the rest as the predictor variables the training data the species data is SPG and the predictors variable is uh, bio C so if I run this one and then execute this object that is generated from STM data it shows a report here the number of species name of species number of features predictor variables but it's a presence only data set so it is automatically detected uh, we have 908 records uh, so it's uh, less than the number we had in this SPG because probably some of them had some duplications or missing values in the predictor variables so the duplications and missing values are automatically excluded but it's uh, presence only data we're gonna have a background or pseudo absence data in in the object to be able to to use many of the available methods so I can add the BG argument here as a list and inside this I'm gonna specify the method the specified method that by default is G random but uh, you can specify here and the number of records that you require let's generate thousand records and then if I run it again you see that uh, it's now presence background data and the number of record is uh, 1908 records uh, now the data object is created I'm going to run the STM function to um, to fit the models again a species against the rest as predictors i'm going to just specify the data object as the second argument here and the third argument that is methods we are going to specify the name of the methods that uh, we are going to use if you use get method names you're gonna just get a list of the available methods that are available within the pack if, if you use install all uh, you're gonna just have access to all the existing methods currently 19 methods but more can be added by you or by me uh, so as you see many packages are available the uh, abbreviation can be used or other names uh, it's like uh, alias names for the uh, the methods let's just use for example glm who set regression tree random forest and um, let's use uh, uh, for example i don't know fda for example we have four methods and then we're gonna specify since we didn't have any independent test data we're gonna specify which replication method should be used here we can have uh, several together like subsampling and put a strapping for example or one of them for subsampling you're gonna just use uh, let me go into the next line line, line. Uh, you're going to use test percentage the default is 30 percent but uh, I'm specifying anyway and uh, if you specify for example three replications it means that this procedure of subsampling or bootstrapping is repeated three times so 
if I run this one, it means that I'm going to generate three models per method. Uh, in total, 12, uh, 12 output per replication method. So it's uh, 12 for subsampling and 12 for uh, bootstrapping. So subsampling is repeated three times, bootstrapping is repeated three times, so six output for each method. Let's run it. Uh, I should also mention to another argument that might be of your interest, that is uh, parallel setting, that you can specify the uh the number of cores for example you can specify four or in this machine i have eight cores available let's use four of them and then i can specify the parallelization parallelize, parallelization method uh, i just simply use the parallel comes from the parallel package but uh, it's possible to use the other like for each and uh, there are some other details that if you know the how high performance computing uh, works i think it's parallel setting not parallel settings while it's running let's check out the list of the available functions in the package as you see there are many packages for example the add function i mentioned to my presentation in my presentation is used to add the new methods to the package to the list of available methods uh, we have um, coordinates to extract the coordinate values density to generate the density plot ensemble for symbol forecasting of a species distribution evaluates to uh, measure the valuation metric, accuracy performance metric, metrics. Uh, there are some functions like get evaluation. They are they start with get because by default this this STM also evaluates the results, and uh, to extract the eval the details of evaluation out of this M object. You're gonna use this, for example, get evaluation or get variable importance that uh, you have somewhere, for example, this one or get rock. Uh, these these functions just extract the existing details from the object. They are already calculated. So now it's done. If I just simply run M here uh let's make it big uh it just generates again a summary report m is a stm models object we run the stm for only one species it is possible to have multiple species of course the number of modeling method is four this you can see the names both uh, subsampling and bootstrapping are used as a data partitioning procedure and three replications are generated for each one. So we have six uh, outputs per species per method, modeling method. The test percentage for subsampling is 30% and you see that for all the modeling method, 100% of the models are successfully done. And here we have like a summary report. We have the mean AUC value for each method, also correlation metric, TSS, deviance. Uh, so it's like a summary to have an overview of the performance. As you see, most all of the methods uh, did well. Uh, uh, random forest were the best among the other methods, but all are performing very well. Um, uh, so this this object can be used to for prediction or ensemble but if you want to <clears throat> uh, check the details of the uh, inside the uh, object first of all it is always possible to use uh, 
um, like m at sign when you use because we have different uh, form of object s4 object s3 object and object oriented paradigm of r um, so m is s4 object and if you put at sign you're gonna just get uh, the different components different parts of the object that is called the slot we have data we have uh, uh, record IDs we have the setting definitions so these these having all of these details make uh, help to uh, make it reproducible uh, so if for example you go to the models M at sign models and then put a dollar sign you're gonna see the list of species here we have like one species again dollar sign you're gonna see the list of methods uh, uh, if for example go to GLM again dollar sign you're gonna get the model ID it's a unique ID for each model output uh, so the first six is for GLM if I go to for example uh, random forest and put it here you see the start from 13 14 so each model object has a unique model ID and when you get here again put at sign here you're gonna get uh, the details of that a specific model that is uh, that belongs to random forest so this object for example is the model object uh, so it, uh, it generates from the random forest package uh, so in case if you need to extract uh, some specific output that is a way to explore the details here uh, another function here can be used is a GUI, GUI that uh, is a graphical user interface of the package. If you put the M within the GUI function, you're going to have a nice graphical user interface. Uh, so we have different, uh, you know, tabs. And in the first tab, you have the same summary as we saw there. And in the th second tab, you have the details. If you remember, I said we have a model, unique model ID for each uh, output of the STM. So we have uh, 24 models. Uh, the first six uh, are GLM, the second six are boosted regression tree. And the first two, the first three use subsampling, the second three use bootstrapping, and so on. So it specifies the details of the models. Uh, it's like a kind of information about the outputs. And if you go to the evaluation, you see we have plots, different plots here, uh, threshold dependent metrics and threshold independent metrics. In the plots, if you go to rock AUC you can specify the, the species here that is if you add several you you gonna get a list of species but now we have only one so you see the rock curve for all the methods uh, we have GLM subsampling GLM bootstrapping BRT subsampling BRT bootstrapping and so on so for all the methods here is available and they are generated both based on both training and test so it's test dependent is the one that is uh, generated uh, based on data partitioning if you had like an independent data you had the third option that was test independent so you could have the results for all of them together uh, if you want to so it's interactive for example if you want to see the results only for GLM you're going to just specify here as you see it's GLM based on subsampling and GLM based on bootstrap if you want to add random forest as well you're going to just get this one if you want to remove GLM uh, so it's, it's very easy to use if you want to keep only bootstrapping here you see here and then for FDA so you see we have like only bootstrapping for these two techniques and if you want to see the result only for uh, uh, here as you see it all the three 
for example, bootstrapping of random forest had three replications. So here it's a mean rock and you have uh, the older rocks in the background is uh, the lighter color. But if you only want a specific model, for example, 16 here, uh, you see the values for these two a specific model ID. So this way you can uh, you can uh, explore the results and on the plot uh, sorry on the plot you see you have the AUC values as well uh, both based on both training and uh, uh, test data. Uh, you have other plots you know, like calibration plot. Uh, it's a new statistic actually I double I didn't publish it yet but uh, this this measure quantitatively the calibration state of the the this plot uh, don't want to discuss what does it mean what does the meaning of this plot but you can search uh, so it's it's different from discrimination capacity uh, it's the same here to specify which which mod so it's for each unique model generates and when you select the model id you're gonna see uh, for example this one belongs to boosted regression trees subsampling and so on uh, we can have other other methods other parts like uh, <clears throat> We use a kind of threshold optimization to find which uh, which uh, threshold actually is the best, and we have different criteria. The one that, for example, maximizes TSS over different threshold. You see, it behaves like this, and at the threshold of 0 0.47, it is maximal. But you may see which one maximizes. Kappa is the same in this case, which maximize phi, which maximize uh, PPV and so on. So there are different metrics that you can have for each method. So it's interactive and you can explore the details. You have the density plot as well that shows the discrimination capacity of the method uh, so it's probability estimation of probability uh, the range of probability estimated by the model over the real presences or real absences as you see they are discriminated well um, and the same in different form is box plot the distribution of estimated probability for the presence points and for the absence points so you see how well they are discriminated uh, this one actually is a table that shows all the threshold dependent metrics like sensitivity, specificity, TSS, kappa for all the possible threshold. We use 10 criteria, optimization criteria, like the first one is a specificity equals sensitivity. The second one is the one that maximizes TSS or sensitivity plus a specificity. So it finds the best threshold, and based on this threshold, these statistics are calculated here. So in all in many functions in the package, actually, we may need to specify which of these thresholds should be used, and it can either be specified by directly specifying the criteria or you can specify simply one two three two refers to this this criteria three refers to this one and so on so you can always uh, keep this this in mind of course it's available in the help page of the package but uh, just keep in mind that what does it mean uh, the argument is usually OPT uh, so these these metrics are threshold dependent metric, but we have some threshold independent metrics like prevalence, AUC correlation, deviance, calibration, and so on. So they are gonna. Uh, I'm working on some new metrics as well that will be included in the next versions of the package. Uh, 
There is another one that uh, generates the graph for variable importance. Uh, two metrics are used based on correlation, Pearson correlation test or based on AUC test. That generates the which which variables are important for each model. So this one is a GLM, but if you go, for example, in Boosted Regression 3, you're going to see this one, or if you go to um, to random forest or to fda so for most of them actually you see bio3 is the most important one but for the rest uh, the state is slightly different so that is uh, a way to interactively explore the details within the object uh, when you're done you can simply close the the window and you get here again <coughs> In the next step, I'm going to generate a predict using the predict function. I'm going to just specify the M here, the model object. And then the second would be the data, the new data that is uh, bio C here. Uh, I may use if if you want to see the potential. So we use the BIOC that if you remember BIOC was the cropped one. We we just cropped over the area that we think is more realistic to generate through the absence because uh, there are some studies that show that uh, a pseudo absence the model is sensitive to the pseudo absence. That's why it's better to limit the area, the extent of the study to the potential areas that uh, are more realistic for the species rather than just including everywhere. That's why we just included the area The if I get back to the plot, this area as the study area. But to generate the prediction, I may use the whole world. I, here in this case, I'm going to just use uh, bio, the uh, opt of the 19 by clean variables of course those eight variables are used from this one and then I can use uh, like a file name uh, that uh, that uh, I can say what 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 can where the output can be saved so it's like a multi-layer because we had like 20 four out models within the SDM object for each unique each individual model actually the uh, raster output will be stored I can use for example a name like pr.img uh, you can specify the if you have uh, RG doll package uh, in, in your installed on your machine you can have a uh, uh, that you can specify different commonly used uh, raster format here like TIFF, uh, IMG and many other more. So I am specifying uh, IMG here uh, and that's it. If I just run this one, uh, let's see what happens. So before it finished let let me discuss also the ensemble function that uh, actually this one generates 24 outputs 24 assets but ensemble those 24 assets are going to be combined into a to into a single raster if i just use the ensemble function it's the same M and then it can be bio, the predictor variables. I can specify file name like en.img or whatever you prefer. And then uh, we, we are going to, we're gonna need another argument that is uh, the setting. Here in the setting, the most important is the method uh, for example, I'm going to use a weighted averaging here. When you use weighted averaging, you're going to specify which metric you're going to use as as, uh, as the weight. I'm going to use TSS. And if I use TSS, I'm going to specify the optimization threshold because TSS is a threshold dependent 
and then from that table that I showed uh, we had 10 rows and I'm going to refer to the second row that is the one that maximized TSS. There are some other arguments like for example ID if I specify ID I may specify like I just need to generate the ensemble based on the models with the ID of 1, 3, uh, 4, 8, uh, I don't know, 12, 22 and so on. So if there is a reason, a justification that you only need to use this to generate ensemble based on this output, uh, you, can, uh, you can specify them. But if you don't specify all the models that are successfully generated are going to be used here. Um, here for the ensemble function, we have different methods. Let's uh, check the help page of the package uh, while the function is running. So I put the details here for, for different methods. Unweighted is uh, unweighted average unweighted is a simple mean over all the outputs. Unweighted is weighted based on the metric that we specify here. We can use median, it's like a simple median function. But there are some other, uh, other way to combine them. For example, PA or presence absence first convert the probab the predicted probability of occurrence to a presence absence distribution and then combine them together and make an average over those uh, values uh, so that is the difference here we use presence absence but in weighted we use the pr probability of occurrence uh, we have some methods that has two parts, mean weighted, mean unweighted, median weighted, median unweighted. So these four actually refers to, for example, this mean weighted actually first take an unweighted mean over the uh, output of a single method, for example, uh, here in uh, in this one we had three output for glm based on uh, three output for G, uh, for glm based on uh, subsampling three output based on uh, based on uh, bootstrapping and then for the other method so it first generates one output for each method, for GLM one output that take an average and then we have a one output for each method and then use a weighted averaging to combine the single output of each method to an ensemble output. Uh, it's the, the, the same logic works for the rest. Uh, it may be mean, mean or mean unweighted uh, that first take mean over the output of single method and then combine them together or mean uh, median it first take median of the uh, output for the single and then use a weighted averaging and so on uh, there is also one that is called uncertainty or entropy it simply measures the entropy over the prediction presence predicted presence absence at each pixel so it is it can be uh, representing a kind of model based uncertainty or inconsistency uh, between the output of different techniques we have for each pixel we have 24 models and each one uh, generate uh, a, a predicted presence or absence we may have some situation that for a pixel all the model predict all the models predicted presence value but in some situation we may have some methods some models predicted presence and other methods predicted absence so it is the kind of inconsistency which one are correct we may have like a range of uh, maximum inconsistency 
that is the situation when we have half of the models predicted presence for a pixel and the other half predicted absence so it's a maximum inconsistency uh, and uh, when all are the same it's a minimum inconsistency that uh, all the methods are predicted the single same value uh, so to, to calculate that one we use the entropy metric so if you just simply put entropy here you're gonna have the output uh, that output um, now it is done let's look at this uh, result it's a raster brick with 24 and if you check the name here uh, you see the names of p1 you see it's like a kind of uh, abbreviated name It's the model id1 for the first species the name of model is uh, glm and the replication method is subsampling it is again everything is the same but the model id is different and so on so you're going to find some information about the method the replications the model id and so on from the name of the variable and if you just uh, plot them let's plot the first uh, seven the uh, 13 and 23 four of them uh, we have one output per method so you see here we have a pre probability predicted probability of occurrence for for different uh, methods and uh, uh, it's uh, random for us in uh, FDA flexible discriminant analysis boosted regression tree and uh, GLM uh, so you see there are there are some differences and there may be inconsistent in some pixels some areas and it would be always good to address this inconsistency using combining them together using the ensemble function if I run this one uh, actually they are combined using a weighted averaging uh, but since I put the bio here as the input uh, the predictors this predict is going it, it, it the function is going to first use the predict function to generate the predict value uh, and then put into the ensemble procedure but if you already generated these predictor values predictors alternatively you may just use uh, p1 the output of predictors here uh, so it works only when all the predictors output are generated correctly because it simply check whether the number of layers within this object is the same as the number of um, outputs in the model the number of models in the m object if i use this one let's see what happens so it just generates a, a message that the raster object this one is used as the predicted probability not as the new data or predictor variables um, and now if I just check this one you see the potential distribution of the the um, potential distribution of that species uh, for the current time um, but the purpose of this exercise was to have them for the future time as well to do that we are going to first download the climatic variables for the future time the get data function if we go to the help page you see that to download the uh, the cmip5 projection for uh, different uh, gcm models 
and uh, for the target year here 2070 and the resolution as well as the variable that we can specify here can be downloaded using this function there are different uh, different modeling method available also the rcp scenario is uh, also different rcp scenarios or uh, can be specified here let's copy this one paste here i'm going to use bioclean variable the same bioclean variable in the same resolution and uh, yes that's it uh, that's this one because it's like uh, exercise to see how it works let's name it bio f and uh, if i just run this one uh, it okay i just checked uh, what caused caused the error it seems that some for some of the models the uh, file is not available it the way i just tried this this model and it worked so the bio f now is uh, 19 the same 19 variables uh, wire clean variables but for the year 2070 uh, let's uh, plot one of them to see how it looks like so we have uh, annual mean temperature for the future time for 2070 uh, but one one thing that you should consider here and fix it is the name of the variables here you see we the name represent the model and rcp scenario and uh, the year so it's not like bio 1 till bio 19 that was uh, assigned to the the same layers for the current time and if you use this variable the model is not going to understand which predictors actually are those that have been used to fit the model. That's why we need to first change the names as the name that uh, was used to fit the models. So if I ch uh, check the name of the bio object, the same object for the current time, you see it's bio 1, 2 until bio 19 and the order is uh, exactly uh, I mean the files are, are in order so it starts from bio 1 2 until bio 19 and if I check here the last digit the last digit here refers to the bioclim layer 1 2 3 until 19 so I just made sure that the names are, I mean the layers in bio f uses the same order as the layers in bio the layers in the current time that's why i can simply say that change the names of bio f the same as the names of bio now if i just check the name the new names of bio f you see they are the same as the layers in the current time and now it's uh, then it would be the same uh, to i mean en2 can be an object of uh, an object of the ensemble output for the future time and here we can uh, uh, we didn't generate the predict function if you want you would use the same but with bio f but now i only want to generate the predicted i mean the output uh, the ensemble output so i put the predictor variables here the first is the model object the predictor values for the future time and then a name and the setting everything is the same and then run this model to see what happens okay now the function just uh, finished the job let's plot it to see the output 
So that is the distribution, the ensemble distribution for the future time. We had uh, EN1 for the current time. Let's plot it again. I don't know if you realize the changes. But there are some changes. Uh, we may uh, we may use a different color uh, color scheme to be able to better to understand the changes visually uh, or put them together or quantitatively changes the I mean quantitatively uh, calculate the changes. Let's first uh, explore explore it visually. Uh, for this purpose, I'm going to just simply uh, specify a color color scheme, like a nicer color, like color ramp palette that uh, can be used to specify a graduate of color. So you can specify some colors here in this color scheme and it generates a uh, kind of uh, gradual color changes. To do that, you can specify different colors, for example, dark blue, um, blue, green, yellow. Actually, I already specified some colors uh, somewhere. I'm going to just paste them here. These two colors that I specified the code is like hex code for the colors are kind of uh, blue colors. You can find the hex code for all the colors uh, just by Googling the hex code for colors, something like this. So I just specify the six colors and then if I generate this one, it's a function to generate the color RAM palette. Uh, and now if I just run again this EN1 with the argument color equals seal in front of seal, I'm going to specify the, the color levels here. More is better, of course, if, if you specify less number, you're going to just lose these gradual changes here. So if I run this one, you see uh, that uh, the values are starting from these, these colors that I specified here and gradually changes to this color. So we can see that the suitable areas are getting toward dark red here. Uh, and I can use the same for E and 2 and then you can see that uh, there are some contraction here in the distribution. Let me uh, use another package that is called uh, map view. It's the one that you can use uh, to interactively explore uh, the, any spatial data, we visualize them and interactively work with them, for example, zoom over different places. You can simply use map view and uh, I'm going to use both layers there. That's why I can have uh, combine them first using a stack function. So I'm going to use a stack of these two layers they are stacked into a single raster stack object and then they are put into the map view function. Uh, if I use the call region, let me check the help page of the, it is uh, call.regions equal again here I'm going to apply the color scheme I specified and it's going to generate this nice map of uh, uh, suitability value and if the good thing here is that I can zoom in and uh, I can you see I can have these two together to compare. So you can see, for example, these areas are contracted southward as a result of 
climate change. It's a nice package for visualizing any spatial data. Of course, you can have it with uh, images or different uh, background layers. Uh, so it would be good for, you know, interpretation of the result. And uh, turn on this one so you can see. It's also possible to use a kind of topographic map. And again, you see that the high suitability is for the area with a high topographical slope. Uh, you can uh, add uh, the spatial points data on top of that if you want to see. You can use a plus function and then put uh, this SPG here. Um, actually, I get an error and I think the reason is that the SPG, uh, the coordinate reference system for SPG was not defined. Uh, so before that, I need to specify uh, the projection through approach for a string function. If, if now I run this uh, uh, this function, it says no definition is there for coordinate reference system, but uh, the coordinate of uh, this object is the same as uh, EN1 or EN2, uh, you know, to get this definition for the raster object, you're gonna use the projection function, but the definition for the spatial object, spatial vector object, like spatial points, you're gonna use approach for a string. So I'm going to define this coordinate reference system for this one as well, because I know that they are using the same coordinate reference system, both are geographic. So I can simply assign this definition extracted from this EN1 to this one. And now if I run the function again. Okay, I realize what was the problem. If you have like two objects here, I don't know for some reason it's not working. So I just removed the I just, rather than a stack of two layers, I just put uh, a raster here, that is the distribution for the current term, and then add the spatial object here. So you can see the points, uh, and then you can compare how they are distributed. Uh, so that is a way to visualize the data. But uh, now we are going to quantify the changes uh, quantitatively. So we have EN1 and EN2 uh, as a probability of occurrence. One way is to simply uh, calculate the change like EN2 minus EN1, right? Then you have like CH that is going to have some pixels with with positive value, some pixels with negative value. Negative means more suit, uh, negative means less suitability in the future compared to the current time means suitability is, suitability is declined and positive means suitability is increased for the species. If I plot CH uh, probably we need to use a different color scheme like make CL2 as a color ramp palette but we are going to have like a, a green color for the area with a, a, with a positive uh, sorry red for negative and gray for 
yellow, gray, and then for example, green and blue. We may have since uh, it's it's uh, the the range is more in negative compared to the positive. I'm going to use uh, another color here, like um, orange, for example. Let's see what happen. Call equal CO to 200 levels. So you see we have uh kind of the negative values for the for the suitability decline and a positive for the pixels that the suitability is increased and this shows uh, for many areas actually the the suitability is decreased will be decreased in future as a result of climate change that is a simple way to have a rough estimation about what happens but uh, we may use uh, the changes based on we may calculate the changes based on presence absence rather than probability of occurrence to do that first we need to convert this probability of occurrence to the presence absence for converting this probability of occurrence and symbol output to a presence absence we are going to use a threshold so the threshold can be calculated using the evaluates function in the stm package if you go to the help page you have the observation the presence absence of observation as the first argument and the predicted probability of occurrence as the second argument the presence absence of observations are those that we have in the data right in the stm data object that we uh, created based on those records that are downloaded from gbf and we also generated pseudo absence right and uh, then the probability of occurrence can be uh, extracted from the ensemble the um, ensemble output in the current time first uh, we can simply convert this stm data to a data frame as a data frame we can convert d to df if i check the head of df you see we have a species data and uh, predictor variables but we also need to we need we also need the coordinate records uh, and the coordinates can be extracted from the coordinate time from this table we need this a species column so it's a presence and background records uh, so i can have like uh, a new df make a data frame to put uh, a species equal df dollar species only this this uh, column and then the coordinates of d that extracts the coordinate value from the d object and then if i check again the head of df you see i only kept the, this column from this previous df and then added these coordinate columns here and uh, now i can use these two columns to extract the uh, probability of occurrence from en1 uh, so in the evaluates function the first uh, column the first uh, vector that i need to specify is df dollar species so it's uh, simply presence and absence records for all uh, the data that i have and then i can extract from en1 the values over the points specified in df so i i need to specify the 
column the coordinate columns here so this extract let me separate them uh, to avoid the confusion uh, let me make it as a, a p so p so i put this uh, matrix here so here i just need the columns of longitude and latitude extracted from this df and convert them to a matrix if i put it in xy the head of xy would be like this and the extract function actually is from the raster package because we have some extract functions in the other package to avoid the confusion we specify the name of the package here uh, and then uh, we specify x y here and this is resulted to a vector of p uh, that is the probability of occurrence for all the records in df so the number of row in df is 1108 and the length of p also is the same 109 1908 and then the observation we put the observation here the species column in df and the predicted value here and put it in ev the result so the result is um, the result is based on comparing the whole records uh, presence to the absence record with the ensemble output so here in ev we have different uh, here in EV the output of evaluation we have uh, different slots different components but we need we are gonna in the statistic for example you can see the AUC value all threshold independent statistic and in EV threshold based table we are going to see that uh, all the metrics based on different thresholds uh, found through this criteria so we're going to just uh, use this threshold the one that is calculated based on maximizing tss the tss value here in this case is 0 0.885 uh, so i can simply go to threshold column and take the second item which is this one as a threshold so i extracted the threshold and then the, and now i can convert uh, uh, both current time and future time to a presence current presence absence and future presence absence to do that i can simply use the if else function the if else function is very simple here we are going to use the name of the raster with a square bracket in front uh, we can simply say which pixels within e and one is greater or equal than the threshold we assign here if it's the case the value would be one otherwise the value would be zero that is the if else and uh, i'm going to uh, i'm going to make a new raster out of en1 and make it pa1 so using the raster function and put the raster makes an empty raster with the same definition the same extent the same resolution as the one that you put here so i'm going to assign these values to the pixels of this pa1 so don't forget this square brackets in front uh, because it works with the values inside the raster so if i run this one I'm going to get uh, the patterns of presence and absence 1 and 0 and I can repeat the same for the future so 
sorry, I forgot to run this one. And this is the presence absence for the future time. And if I compare P a two with P a one and subtract them, I'm going to make a CHP object. If I plot CHP, I'm going to get three possible values. Zero means no change, either in presence or absence. One is uh, when when in the future time we have one but in the current time we have zero it means that we would end up with one here uh, so it means that uh, it's, it's a kind of expansion or colonization but if in future we have zero but in the current time we have one we, we're gonna end up with minus one it means uh, uh, it means uh, uh, extinction. So let's define uh, appropriate color. Uh, so the positive one means uh, expansion. Let's make it uh, blue. No change would be gray. And the extinction, sorry, opposite. The minus one would be red, gray, and blue and let's run it and now you can see that uh, which area we have extinction there are a few pixels with expansion the potential so this way we actually quantified uh, the changes uh, simply for species uh, if you want to have like uh, because this zero means uh, no change either in uh, the unsuitable area or unsuitable area but if you want to specify them you're going to change the value in one of them so you can uh, you can specify which area was uh, the one with no change when it was present uh, okay so far we we finished all the tasks that uh, were required for the exercise but there are some other functions that might be useful to for interpretation for example r curve is uh, the one that generates response curve if you simply put m here and uh, run the functions you you're gonna just get the response care for all the models 24 models and all the variables so you can see uh, you have a confidence interval for each uh, variable and uh, you see the response of a species to the gradient of ranges of course you can specify the id that uh, which which ids you want to specify not all 24 for example if you want it only for GLM uh, only for the first six you can repeat this one and this generates only the linear form of the first six or GLM techniques and uh, if you want only for uh, uh, boosted regression tree it's gonna be this one uh, that uh, you see another function is variable importance uh, you're gonna use get var importance to see the values if you don't if you specify an ID for example the one you see uh, you see the uh, values uh, a report a summary report that uh, shows the percentage of importance for different variables only for this model that we specified here based on both correlation metric and AUC metric but if you use several IDs or don't use all the IDs are specified here and you're gonna see the confidence interval here 
if you put it into a plot function you're gonna just see the results uh, for for uh, uh, all models uh, of course you can specify also the method uh, uh, this one is only for GLM this one is only for RF rather than specifying ID you may specify method another function that might be useful is niche in niche you're gonna use uh, the name of the predictor variables here we're going to use bio c for example and then specify uh, sorry bio and then specify the suitability map which is en1 and then we are going to specify the name of because it's like a two-dimensional niche we are going to specify the name of the um, predictor variables for example let's see the niche as a function of this bio 3 and bio 18 because they are kind of important uh you may specify also a color scheme here let's specify the the one that we use to map the date of the probability of occurrence and if you generate this one you're gonna have the two-dimensional niche with the suitability value so it's like uh, mapping the suitability over the environmental space that is very useful for interpretation of the results so you see how it works uh, the distribution of the pixels over uh, in this environmental space and you see which part of this environmental space are suitable for the species of course you can change the name of the variables and uh, the color